So we had a great discussion last week uh, dealing with the first portions of Matthew chapter 18. We're just going to refresh just a little bit and then dive back in. We made it through about verse 6, I want to say. We, we discussed some of... Uh, We discussed six, and we discussed some of seven, but we didn't really, I don't know, I don't feel like we closed out verse seven, um, but we had a great discussion ending up with the thought, you know, how a lot of people say, why do good things happen to bad people? And we had to talk first, uh, I'm sorry, why do bad things happen to good people? Other way around. Um, yeah, the other is true as well, but, but we talked about the whole idea to start with that no one is good. Uh, God is the only one that is good. Jesus as God was also good. So the whole question, why do bad things happen to good people, is really uh, not a good question. Because we all sin and we all fail God. So to ponder the idea of why do bad things happen to sinful people, oh, that changes the scenario a little bit. So then we talked about why do bad things happen in the first place. We went back to creation and all things had been created as good to start with. And then man had a choice and man chose a little differently. And that choice then had consequences that bear on all of us throughout time. We also bear the consequences for our choices in, in the, more, the shorter domain of time. And so bad things will happen. And Jesus said that in verse 7. He says, woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. He says, such things must come. I think some versions, I think more appropriately say some things, stumbling blocks are inevitable, basically. Trials are inevitable. Challenges are inevitable. And Jesus says those things must come. Well, we talked a little bit about that uh, last week, and I'm not going to rehash that. But one thing that I wanted to bring uh, to attention to was Jesus himself experienced stumbling blocks, trials. In his humanity, he was confronted by the same things that cause us to question. So for us to even ask the question, well, why does God allow bad things to happen to seemingly good people? Well, he allowed those things to happen to his son, who was perfect. So the question really has, has no weight. Uh, from our human box, our human perspective, we can ask the question, we can ponder, wow, why do these things happen? But in the righteousness of God, the question is really invalid. Jesus also said these things must come. I wonder if he was, in his own mind, thinking about the things that would occur to him one of his close companions would sell him out. He had to give up the, the, the perfect humanity that he lived. He gave it up because of the obnoxious behavior of the rest of humanity. So stumbling block, you know, things would even occur to him from here to his sacrifice that would cause him that would try to cause him to leave the plan. You know, even in the garden he prayed, if there's any other way that this could happen, let's go that route. But, Father, let's do your will. You know, but, but there were temptations that occur along the way that would seemingly drive him away from the plan. The stumbling blocks were inevitable. They were there. Satan put them in front of him, and he had to tackle them in order for him to fulfill the purpose of salvation. The same is true for us. Stumbling blocks will occur. I think we said last week that roses don't come without thorns. So the thorns, the thorns exist, and we just have to learn to deal with them and overcome them. And sometimes we don't, and thank God for grace and forgiveness. Right? All right, so I, I just wanted to loop back and, and cover that right quick before we moved on. Jesus also says, uh, I'm going to start at, at verse 7. We'll reread that, and then we'll keep going through verse 9. 
Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And then he repeats himself. You, that, that tells you how significant or how, how severe this issue could be. Jesus says it twice. If your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to enter life with one eye rather than two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. Serious stuff, Jesus says. And remember what our context is. Our context is the idea of the, the, the disciples had been arguing about who was going to be the greatest. And Jesus says, hey, you need to empty yourself, become humble, uh, get rid of your preconceived notions of what the kingdom is, become like a child, and in that um, vulnerability, start learning about the kingdom, start growing into the kingdom life. And if in that growth you find that one of your, and this is hyperbole, but if your body parts are causing you to go a different direction, causing you to sin against God, it is, that's such a serious matter that it's better for you to cut off the body part and live the, the, the righteous life than to keep your body parts and die in judgment. And that's such a serious thing, he has to state it twice. And that's a parallelism. That's, you know, a lot of times when a teaching is so profound they want to emphasize it, they would say it in another way twice. And, and we've talked about parallelism uh, throughout our class here, but that's a, an essence of parallelism that, parallelism that Jesus uses here. One of the things, and I, I wasn't sure if I wanted to go there, but I, I do want to briefly mention it here. Um, we didn't mention it the first time Jesus said the same thing. We've, we've actually visited this same conversation once before. I believe it was Matthew chapter 5. If, we, if you want to just look back there right quick, you, you're welcome to. Matthew 5, and this is in what we know of as the Sermon on the Mount, verse 29. And in this case, it's, it's along the context of adultery that he's talking. But he says, if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose the, that one part of your body than for your whole body uh, to be thrown into hell. So he's, he's had this same conversation. So you know, remember I said, ministers, when they get a good thing, they don't just say it once. So very likely this was said multiple times throughout his ministry. It's important stuff. It's, it's really serious that these people grasp this. Now, what is the picture that it's given here? First off, we have life. It's better to have life, you know, cut off the feature, whatever that feature is, whether it's your, your straying hands or your foot that takes you down the wrong path or your eyes that cause you to notice the wrong things uh, or your, your, your heart that's going the wrong way. Cut it out. Uh, circumcise it in a way that gets that sin away from you so that you can have life. Now, we're talking about here God's judgment and an eternal um, existence, an eternal existence. In the case of the righteous, the one who does cut off the limb that might lead to sin and stays in, uh, righteous, that eternal existence is one of life. It's one of vivacity. It's one of, we, Greg talked about this morning, worship, uh, where we have a, a full... Um, interface is the word that comes to mind, but presence, a full presence with God. Contrast that then with what, what Jesus says, eternal fire, or what's rendered hell in our, our passages. Where does that idea come from? Where does this idea of what it, it, the bad judgment the non-life judgment come from? Thoughts on that? Are you asking where it might first be referred to? 
Possibly. Or, or how does it come about? Why, does, why is it pictured as fire? Okay. Fire purges. I like that. But at that point, well, yeah, it's kind of, hmm. You know, when you put gold in a fire, you're, you're taking off the dross. You're removing the bad stuff so that you can have the pure. Um, at that point, though, in judgment, you're just using the fire to get rid of the dross, I guess, so the pure can then be uh, retained. The unrighteous won't be, go ahead. Okay, I think we're getting closer there. Um, I like that. Uh, no, I, I like the other two, but I'm not sure it fits this particular context. But the, uh, the sacrifices, when you, when you actually offer a sacrifice, you would burn it entirely. Um, and, and it would become ashes. Okay. Okay. The controlled burn that fits very much with what Steve was saying about uh, the purification. Absolutely. The I and and I, I can't really say necessarily about this concept of fire, except for us, fire represents anguish, um, or at least it has it has come to represent anguish. But. When Jesus uses the word hell, that word hell that's translated there, it's actually the word Gehenna. Well, Gehenna was a place. Gehenna was a place in, in the Old Testament. We read of it in several places that it was located. It was a valley. It was, in Hebrew, it is Gah Benehenam. It is the valley of the sons of Hinnom. And it lay southwest of the city of Jerusalem. Not, not far, just like, you know, yards away. You know, not even miles away, just yards away. It was throughout the, the time of the kings, especially the later kings, but as early as Solomon, it was a place where the Israelites worshipped Molech and other idols. Uh, Solomon erected idols, the Asherah, you know, the, the, the poles, the Asherah poles and things. And it was a place where they even sacrificed their children in this location. If we were to go, um, the, the actual location is noted in Joshua and also in Nehemiah. But if we were to go to um, Chronicles, Second Chronicles 28, the latter kings especially, um, and I'm trying to remember, Uzziah, I believe, was one of them. I, I, I might be wrong on that. And then, um, oh, why do the names escape me? Um, a really bad one. Hezekiah's son, Manasseh. Manasseh. Uh, had these really bad practices uh, where they would offer their kids there. So let's go Second Chronicles 28 verse eh, 3. Ahaz, unlike David his father, um, did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. So verse 3, he burned sacrifices, here we are, in the valley of Ben-Hinnom. Okay? Hebrew, that's Gehenna, or Kebenahinnom. Okay? Sacrificing his children in the fire, engaging in the detestable practices of the Lord, of the nations, the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. So it's noted here, that bad things happened in this area. And there was even a, the, a set of altars in, in a place called uh, Tophet. Um, 
when we get to Josiah, he tore down all of these altars that were at that area. Uh, but we see it again in Second Chronicles 33. Second, Second Chronicles 33, we see Manasseh. So it was Ahaz, not Uzziah. Ahaz and Manasseh. 33 verse 6. I will not again make the feet of the Israelites. Uh, keep going, keep going. Oh, that's not the right place. 33, 6. Where is it? Where is it? Oh, oh, I'm on the wrong, wrong verse. Back up, Paul. He sacrificed his children in the fire in the valley of Him, uh, Ben Hinnom, practicing divination and witchcraft, sought omens, consulted mediums and spirits. He did much evil in the eyes of the Lord, arousing his anger. However, uh, we can also read in Jeremiah where it talks about those things as well. But if we go to 2 Kings 23, Second, all the way back to Second Kings. This is in the time of Solomon. Second Kings 23. You remember Solomon had all of these wives and he wanted to appease a lot of his wives. So this is probably the not so wise things that he did. Second Kings 23, verse 13. Um, no, oh, I'm sorry. This isn't, this isn't about Solomon. I didn't even write the verse on Solomon. This is the cleansing. 2 Kings tells us about Josiah coming in and Josiah cleansing these places. Josiah happened after Manasseh, and he's like, okay, those places, not good places. Let's tear them down. And so Josiah, um, where, where did I say, verse 13? Uh, let's go back to verse 10. He desecrated Topheth, which was in the valley of Ben Hinnom, so that no one could use it to sacrifice their son or daughter. What he did, what that means is he sprinkled bones on the area. When you sprinkle human bones on the area, it desecrates it so that it can no longer, can no longer be used for worship okay, to a god. It's desecrating. So he desecrated this, uh, and he did so by the use of um, idolatrous priests. Mm, let's see. And then verse... Here we go. Verse 13, it is. It is the reference to Solomon. The king also desecrated the high places that were east of Jerusalem on the south of the hill of corruption, the ones King Solomon of Israel had built uh, for Ashtaroth, the vile goddess uh, of the Sidonians, for Chemosh, the vile god of Moab, and for Molech, the detestable god of the people of Ammon. So Joash, awesome guy that he was, he made significant efforts to purge the land of all of these idols, this, this idolatry. But this is the story of this area. Uh, people would have known this area as one that God didn't like and one where human beings were offered in fire and the pain of that fire. Even babies. So, Jeremiah talks about this he prophesies about this place Jeremiah 7 I didn't write all these on the board I it probably would have been good for me too but there are so many of them I feel like I'm hopping around so Jeremiah 7 verse 31 Jeremiah introduces or prophesies that this place will lose its name it will no longer be called what it has normally been called but it is now going to be called the valley of slaughter and this is more of a, a prophecy verse 31 they have built the high places of Topheth in the valley of Ben Hinnom that's this that's the Gehenna that Jesus uses the word Gehenna to burn their sons and daughters in the fire something I did not command nor did it even enter my mind so Beware, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when people will no longer call it Topheth, or the valley of Ben Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter. For they will bury the dead in Topheth until there is no more room. Then the carcasses of this people will become food for the birds and wild animals, and there will be no one to fight, uh, frighten them away. I will bring an end to the sounds of joy and gladness and to the voices of bride and bridegroom in the towns of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem, for the land will become destitute or desolate. So Jeremiah is issuing this prophecy about a judgment from God on the people. 
And I think Jesus is borrowing that idea of what the people would understand from the prophecies about this place. And he's using the same language. He's using the same idea. We can see the same thing in Isaiah. If we go to the end of Isaiah, um, several places. Isaiah 30, uh, he uses it. But he also says it in Isaiah 50. Let's look at Isaiah well, Isaiah 50, verse 11, right quick, but then we'll go to 66. Uh, Isaiah 50, verse 11. This is why, um, you know, all you who light fires. Do you have set a blaze? That doesn't look right. I may have the wrong verse there. Um, let's go to 66. Isaiah 66 is the very end of Isaiah. And, and this plays into the same judgment idea that Jeremiah gave. Isaiah 66, verse 24. And I'm going to read just a snippet of verse 22. As the new heavens and the new earth that I will make will endure before me, so will your name and the descendants endure. And verse 24, they will go out and look on the dead bodies of those who have rebelled against me, the worms that eat them and will not die, the fire that burns them will not be quenched, and they will be loathsome to all mankind. If we read Mark, the same, the same idea in Mark, Jesus is actually quoting this passage when he connects it to the word Gehenna. So, it's my understanding that Isaiah is talking about this place called Gehenna. Why does Jesus use that idea when he talks about the fires of hell? When he talks about judgment of God? I think there are several different things that scholars have said throughout time. Scholars have said that Gehenna became the garbage dump for Jer Jerusalem. And uh, I can remember times in my youth when I would go to the, the dump, the city dump, and fires were always burning at the city dump because they were trying to burn it down. Um, and yes, there were bugs and whatnot crawling all over quite a bit of stuff. So there is an idea there that Gehenna represented the city dump that was always burning. And that's also where they would have buried or, or thrown the individuals who died that they didn't have a burial place. Now, was that a reality? I don't think so. Um, there's no archaeological, no literary evidence that says that the, that was a city dump. I think the city had to have some place to dump refuse. But we don't know what that was, where that was, um, or that it was the extent to which is represented here. Um, it was actually an idea that was created in the 1200s by a Jewish rabbi. And he posed this idea, and it seemed right, and everyone has kind of embraced it as they've moved along. So was Jesus referring to the dump to give an image to the final judgment? Jesus did that all the time. You know, he, he, would, he would look at a, a person plowing a field and he would create a teaching out of that image. So it's not unusual for Jesus. It, it would be quite viable for him to look at a dump and reference that dump in light of a judgment teaching. That's possible. I don't think that's probable, but that's possible. I'm sorry, say that again. Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't know that that specific place. When you did a sacrifice and you had the ash and you had the excess, you had to take it somewhere. Did they take it to the Valley of Hymnon? I don't know. Um, archaeology does not expose the fact that there was a significant human remain or human um, 
dump, like uh, pottery and that sort of thing, which most of the things that would break, the things that would break most easily is pottery. And so what do you do with dead pottery? You throw it out. There's not a significant archaeological evidence of a lot of pottery in this location yet. I've got to say yet, because archaeology is always exposing new things. So it's hard to say that that really was a place where they put their dump. There is more archaeological evidence that there was a dump in the valley of, um, oh, the name escapes me. It's, it's connected to the valley of Himnon. Um, I actually have it in my notes here somewhere. Kidron, Kidron the Kidron Valley. Because, <laughs> at least in part, that's where Joash threw all that junk that he burned up. Okay. Um, in 2 Kings 23, it talks about in Joash, oh, I'm sorry, not Joash, Josiah. I, 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 may, I keep saying Joash. Josiah is the king who did that. Josiah would throw all this stuff and he'd say, take it to the valley of uh, the Kidron Valley. So we know that there was some sort of dump at one time in the Kidron Valley. We don't know if the Valley of Hymnon was used as a dump. Could be. Don't know. There is also a number of scholars who, there are a number of scholars, is a number? Yes, whatever. Who say that it was a common teaching by rabbis at the time, in the first century, about this idea that Gehenna represented eternal, well, not eternal, judgment of God. Um, and so if that's true, Jesus is borrowing on a very common expression or a commonly understood teaching at the time to overlay that with his teaching. Uh, what I have found, though, is most scholars who believe that the Jewish rabbis taught that, yes, believe that the Jewish rabbis who taught that are saying it was a temporary judgment. That it only lasted for about 12 months. Kind of like purgatory. The Catholic idea of purgatory. Where you serve your punishment and then you move on to uh, eternal life. There are other scholars that say that that really couldn't be. That that idea did exist in Jewish thought but it was later. It was in the second and third centuries. So, if it was truly um, an idea in the first century, Jesus might have been applying that idea to help his readers or his, his learners, his apostles, understand. But I, I still think, I still sit on, he's just borrowing the judgment language from Jeremiah and Isaiah and the picture that is given by those. Uh, because of what they represented at that time. Remember, Jeremiah and Isaiah were prophesying at a time before the Babylonian captivity. And Babylon came in and they took the city and they tore down the temple, destroyed the first temple. And so it was, it was, it was a prophecy, and a lot of prophecies represent something current at the time, as well as something more eternal or long term. And so this is something that would have been understood in Jeremiah's time. What was going to happen? They readily understood Topheth. They readily understood the Valley of Hemnon. They knew what happened there. They knew the God's judgment on what happened there. And, and so it would have been accessible to them when Jeremiah said what Jeremiah said. When Isaiah said what Isaiah said. And so Jesus is saying, you remember that? You remember all of that teaching that you got? You know, all the learning that you might have had about that time? That's, a, that's true stuff. And that's the kind of thing that's going to happen if you don't become a true blue kingdom liver, kingdom seeker. So I think he's just borrowing some of that same language. Um, is it a reality? Is it true that hell is fire? That hell is eternity of burning up? None of us knows. You know, I, we, we get the picture. We understand the picture that Jesus is giving. We don't know if that's a picture that's given to us because that's something we as humans can understand or if that's reality. That is what hell, hell really is. Okay. Jesus gives us the picture of Abraham, uh, Abraham's bosom, you know, the, the, the rich man and the Lazarus, the picture of their, 
of the, the rich man was in uh, a place of torment. Is that reality? Is that truly what is? Or is that a picture that helps us understand and place value on eternal judgment and eternal life? You know, we, we don't know what heaven will really look like. We have John's description. We have other descriptions. But we don't really know truly what. So how can we say what hell will look like? I think they're just images that are given to us so that we can parse out, yeah, that's a bad thing. Oof, I don't want that to happen. Okay, for us to really make a, you know, a committed decision. I know, I've kind of meandered on that, but I, I didn't touch it when we talked about uh, in Matthew 5, but I wanted to see if we could at least broach it because we're going to get in. The, more, the closer we are to the end of Matthew, the closer we are on to, to conversations like this, where Jesus is talking about judgment and salvation from the judgment. You know, we could talk about that. So I wanted to at least lay out some groundwork or, or, or lay out some ideas that might um, give us some food for thought along those lines. The ultimate point in this passage is Jesus says, look, this is serious stuff. You have a choice, life or Gehenna. And here's what those might look like. And here's how serious it is. Cut off your hand if it's going to lead you there. Cut off your hand if it's going to, or your, your foot if it's going to lead you there. Gouge out your eyes. This is serious stuff. So that's where he was going with that. And it, it makes sense because of the context or the flow of this whole chapter. I believe this whole chapter I've said last week is fluid. Um, it is not chunked out like our Bibles, our editors have them chunked out. And it really is a fluid idea of what it means to become a child of God, what it means to become a disciple of Jesus. Empty yourself, become like a child, but don't stay there. You've got to grow, you've got to mature. Well, in that maturing, things happen. Decisions have to be made, paths have to be trod. And we're getting to a point where he's going to talk about wandering, getting off the path, going astray. Well, this kind of thing where you know, we have to decide, is our hand going to cause us to get off the path? Is our foot going to cause us to go the wrong way? So we're getting to that same conversation. It's a fluid conversation. And, and so I think it's important to, to address that. Okay. Enough said. Verse 9. No. We already did verse 9. Verse 10. My Bible has this in a new section. I don't like that. Because I think here he's kind of closing out this one little bit of discussion and moving into a new bit of discussion. So he says, See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. So he's looping back to talk about those disciples with the childlike faith, the childlike kingdom liver. Liver. liver, that sounds weird, doesn't it? Kingdom lifer, kingdom liver. <laughs> liver of the kingdom. So he's looping back to kind of put the bookend on that particular discussion of the childlike faith. He's saying, look, it, it doesn't say despise. You remember we talked about the hospitable word? You know, welcomes me. He who welcomes these uh, children last week. It doesn't just mean be hospitable to. In the same sense, do not despise doesn't mean just reject or, or be hateful to. Despise means cause these to stumble. Okay? Despise is it, it, wrapped up in that whole idea. It means lead astray. Put stumbling blocks in front of. So don't do that. For I tell you, and this is interesting, that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. <gasps> We know so little about angels, don't we? It's hard to say what that verse even means. We read in Hebrews, ooh, let me actually, ooh, there we go, Hebrews 1.14. We read in Hebrews where it talks about angels and how angels are serving us, humans. We don't know what that means. We, you know, does it mean that you and I have a guardian angel and each one of us has one assigned? You know, sometimes I think I may need three or four not just one. So I, we don't know necessarily what that means, but 
to some extent, in some capacity, angels do facilitate the connection between us, humanity, and God. And Jesus is saying, the angels who are responsible for the keeping of, protection of, whatever the capacity is, these people of childlike faith are always in, they see the face of God. They're always in direct communication with God. God himself. They're, there's, they're not talking to someone else who's talking to someone else who's talking to someone else who eventually gets up to God. In some way, Jesus is saying, look, God cares so much about these kind of people, these disciples, that their angels are in direct communication with God himself. Again, serious stuff. God's not playing around. Okay. Um, I read somewhere that Jewish thought was that there was hierarchies of angels. I think that comes from um, the 11th century, 1100s. So that'd be the 12th century. Um, I can't remember his name. Maimonides. There was a, a Jewish rabbi that classified angels. And there, I think he made the idea of seven different layers of angels, stages or, or, or levels of angels. I don't know if the Jews at that have, in the first century believed that or not. Um, if they did, then there might be a reference here to these childlike disciples, these disciples that are, are uh, of, of such importance to God that they get the high angel to help them out versus the low angel. I don't think that's necessarily what's going on here, but some scholars have said that. But either way, God really thinks so highly of these disciples that he gives them direct access. Okay. Thoughts before we move on there? I know I didn't spend a lot of time there, but we, it, it would be dangerous, I think, to try to extrapolate too much about the angelic world based on one scripture. Um, but I think the emphasis is there. It's important to God. Serious stuff. All right, verse 11. And we read it. Who has verse 11 in your Bibles? In parentheses. In parentheses, yes. Yes, it's usually not there. And the reason being, some people, well, it's not some people. Depending on the manuscript that you get, that they believe that the oldest manuscripts don't have I should say Greek. The oldest Greek manuscripts don't have verse 11 in there. And they believe, uh, editors believe, that at some point the folks who transcribed Matthew borrowed from Luke a little phrase and put it right into this spot. Well, the, the actual verse, and mine doesn't, see mine doesn't even give it in parentheses. I actually have to go to Luke 19.10 to see what the verse even says in my Bible. I don't like that, but, but I can. So read, read for me what you're... Now, you're doing New American Standard? Yes. Okay, read for me what it says. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. For the Son of Man has come to save, some versions say seek and save, that which is lost. The Peshitta, the Aramaic version of, this, of, the, of Matthew, has that verse. Um, I believe that that verse is original. Now, what is that founded on? Nothing intellectual except the fact that it fits this context. It fits this context very well. It is kind of a transition, but not really a transition. Remember, we're just coming out of how important these people are, these, these new disciples are to Jesus and to God. So important that... His angels, their, their angels see the face of God. And then that's the reason, they're the reason Jesus came, to seek and to save, to save that which is lost. Wow, how profound is that? What, you know, what a task that Jesus would come to save that. Would, wow, that's important, serious stuff. <gasps> Not only that, but we're moving into a section that describes the idea of seeking and saving the, the lambs that were lost, the sheep 
that had gone astray. So why wouldn't it fit in this section? Why wouldn't it make sense in this section? Now, I may be just like those editors that said, oh, this is a good verse, let me go get it from Luke. But I think probably down the line somewhere it just got lost. And the original may have had that verse in it. It makes sense. Whether it was there or not, the verse makes sense as a transition uh, verse from what was being said and how important the, the, the disciple is to Jesus to what is about to be said and how important the disciple is to Jesus, especially the one that has wandered away. So the question is, do we tackle this or do we wait till next week? Oh, it's Cindy's fault. <laughs> We're going to wait till next week. It's Cindy's fault because she loaned me a book that gives a, a pretty cool, you know, several, lots of cool descriptions of sheep. And when we start talking about the wandering sheep, or the lost sheep, or the sheep that has wandered away. I do want to draw from a couple of things that that author has said. Philip Keller, W. Philip Keller is, is his name. Um, because of how much it applies to us, and how much it applies to our walk, or our missteps, one might say. Uh, so I don't want to just zoom through it, and I could zoom through it and make you guys a little bit late. Um, Maybe we'll make better efforts of starting on time, and that way we don't have to do this. But at the same time, it, it's worthy of, of slowing down and talking through just a little bit. Uh, we'll talk about that next week, and then we will get into, and we will definitely have time next week. Well, we definitely should have time next week, let me say that. To get into, I think, a fairly abused verse, section of verses in Matthew. And that's what is often labeled discipline within the church. And it could be viewed that way, but I think that's not a healthy viewing, not a healthy perspective. It is not the intended perspective. Uh, and so I would like to discuss that verse or those verses with a different perspective. Some of it leads to the same conclusion, but with a different perspective, a lot, a lot more gracious perspective than we often see it used in, in the world today, in Christianity today. So we'll talk about that next week. That discussion flows directly into the next section where Peter says, how many times do I need to forgive? So you see how all of this fits together. It's really not chunked out. It's really not sectionalized by, um, as the editors had. It's really a, a single flow of conversation that Jesus has with his disciples to help them understand Christ-like living, kingdom living. Because these guys are going to have to carry the message. They're going to be the, the ambassadors after Jesus uh, leaves this earth. And so he's trying to get them to understand that with a healthy mindset. We'll discuss that. I don't know we, I hope we will get to the um, how many times should I forgive section. Really, there's a lot of verses there, but it can be covered pretty quickly in that, in that one little section. So probably next week we can cover all three of those and finish the chapter, unless we start late and Paul likes to talk. <laughs> there we go. Okay, we'll start early and Paul can still talk. I chase rabbits, I know. I didn't necessarily need to chase the rabbit of Gehenna today, but... It's something that if you were studious and you, you caught that and you wanted to chase that rabbit, it would cause you to question. It would cause you to wonder. So I wanted to lay some of that groundwork so that you could go on and do your own study, um, you know, because I certainly did not cover it thoroughly. I just kind of hinted at a few things so that you could then continue your pursuits if you chose. <laughs> All right, let's pray and then we'll, uh, we'll be dismissed. Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for who you are in all of your glory and majesty uh, as creator and as sustainer. And Father, thank you for Jesus as, as our Savior. Thank you that he was willing to come to this earth to give up uh, his part in the Godhead just you know, momentarily and, and live both as God but as creation, as human, and to experience 
the challenges, the temptations, and the stumbling blocks that we also experience, and, and yet to experience those in perfection. And Father, to give up that life as a sacrifice to cover our sin, my sin, and uh, to bring his blood to you. Wow, what, a, what a, a gift. Help us always to praise him. Help us always to look to him and glorify him and shine his light on the world around us. Help us to not get too caught up in the world around us. We, we live in the world and we have to be actors in this world. Uh, and help us to act in a way that shines your light and, and, and to exposes your love and your story of salvation to those around us even though that it might be challenging, even though we might get um, uh, thrown trials and uh, it, it becomes stumbling blocks to us. Father, help us to always look to you and look to your son. Help us to live through your spirit. Let your spirit wash us and strengthen us and uh, enliven us and, and enlighten us. Thank you, Father, for this time together. Be with those who aren't able to be here. And... Uh, just help us to live for you. It's through, through your son we pray. Amen. I feel like I rambled a lot today. <laughs> it was funny, though. I mean, well, it wasn't funny. This section, I, I think I mentioned this last week. This section, I chased rabbit after rabbit after rabbit. Sometimes it was rabbits who beget rabbits who beget rabbits. Uh, because it was so fascinating. Have you actually read Josephus? Has anyone read Josephus? Wow. Just the, the, the history that he exposed is, is enlightening. Um, he places you there at events, and you see it in living color. And it's like, wow, that's, uh, so that's what happened to Jerusalem. <laughs> and when we talk about Gehenna and judgment of God, it is very easy to see the aftermath of the destruction of Jerusalem in those verses. I mean, we're talking 1.1 million bodies dead in the city of Jerusalem. Because they, were, they had come at the time of Passover. And the Roman siege started, so they couldn't go home. So at any, at any one of these Passover festivals, the population of Jerusalem was so huge that Roman garrisons had to fortify themselves to make sure that peace was kept. Well, by this time, you know, they had rebellions and whatnot, and they had all of these people in the city, and the Roman army came and surrounded it, cut it off. So you had all these people in the city who couldn't get out, Food could not get in. So not only were 1.1 million bodies dead because of famine, or starvation, I should say, but also because of battle, or the aftermath of battle. But you also had a lot of people carted off after Rome actually took the city. But the way Josephus describes the activities the bodies that were in the street, the blood that was just gushing through the streets. And I realize there may be some hyperbole there, but at the same time, it's not hard to connect some of that with some of the judgment words that are used by both Jeremiah and Jesus. Up. Yes, you're going to be fine. Go to the temple. Go to the temple. Yeah. Yeah, all these people. And... And then at the, at the same time, they had people who were supposedly trustworthy. And then they had um, power seekers. And then you had the Romans. So you had this little trifecta going on. <laughs> it's, it was sad, but it, it's enlightening when you read Josephus for what it is. Um, impressive. And, and you start seeing some, you put them, some things together a little bit differently when you actually put yourself there in that in the moment. Uh, hard to read, though. Some of it's hard to read. Good translations. There have been some good translations that are make it easier to, to access. But. You have to keep in mind who he was when you read that. Yes. 
You do, because he'll say things like the traitors. Well, who are the traitors? Are the Romans the traitors? Or are the Jews the traitors? Or is it this faction of the Jews that was actually trying to take over? They really weren't Jews. Well, they were Jews, but they weren't followers of God. <laughs> so who's the traitor here? <laughs> yeah, he became one. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And talked about sacrificing over children. And Michelle talked about the Babylon coming in and her being carted off to Babylon in the years. And he goes to the Holocaust. He goes to the Holocaust. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to be careful. Um, I. I could even get carried away with this, but I chased down some rabbits that didn't um, come to fruition. But it's so easy for uh, the Jewish population, but also for just uh, researchers, to start applying things that aren't necessarily true. It's, it's guess to, guesswork. But they start putting actual dates and they put actual events across this idea of guesswork when there's really no historical uh, validity for the action or the date or whatever. So you have to be kind of cautious how much superstition you, you buy into. Uh, but there are some pretty fascinating, hard-known dates and things that occur. And, and are they coincidence or are they meaningful? It's, it's hard to know. But if they're, if they're only coincidence, they are one heck of a coincidence. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. And, and you can see, you know, just the idea of, of Jerusalem and God's, Jesus' perspective on Jerusalem. You know, when he's looking across the valley at Jerusalem, says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often have, have I, you know, wished to gather you under my wings? You know, he, he loves the people. He loves the, the reason Jerusalem existed at the time. Uh, and he knows what's going to happen to a lot of those people. Um, and, and I think too often, you know, to bring that back to our discussion next week about um, discipline in the church, we approach it wrong. We don't approach it like Jesus approached Jerusalem and the judgment that was going to happen to, the, to it. Um, too often we're almost happy for the discipline in the church to happen. <laughs> but we'll talk about that next week. <laughs>